Hi, I'm Warren Throckmorton. Uh, this past July, I celebrated 15 years of blogging at uh, wthrockmorton.com. And to do that, I had interviews with uh, a number of friends of the blog. Uh, we talked about the different topics that I had written about over that 15 years. One of those friends was Greg Thornberry. Today, I have the pleasure of continuing that conversation with Greg. Uh, we're going to continue talking about uh, Christian celebrity, uh, Trumpism, and a number of topics in a pretty loaded conversation today. Uh, it's uh, always a pleasure to get together with Greg. He's an interesting fellow. Uh, Greg is uh, past president of uh, the King's College. Uh, he's also vice president of the New York Academy of Art at uh, Tribeca, New York. So um, I am glad to, that you're watching and I hope you enjoy uh, listening to our conversation as much as we enjoyed having it. All right, I am pleased to have again with me today, Greg Thornberry. Greg is uh, uh, going to, Greg and I are going to discuss some current events. And uh, Greg, a lot has happened since uh, we last spoke. And um, I'm thinking about a few things. I thought we'd just take a few things here um, uh, in order, well, not in any particular order. Um, one thing that occurs to me is uh, our old friend Eric Metaxas, Punch and Run. Yeah. Um, I, um, I have a clip of that. Oh! But you've seen it. Yeah, uh, I saw you it. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we all saw it. And uh, what was your what was your reaction to that uh, little episode? I mean, you know, it, it's you're coming off of the south lawn of the white house it's a you know super rock'em sock'em moment eric is a you know excitable fellow and i'm you know when you spend uh so much of your time whether it's on his radio show or you know in one-on-one -on -one conversation or on twitter talking about how we're in a civil war you know, it's, you know, the sons of darkness versus the sons of light and, you know, people that, you know, don't vote for Trump are demon possessed people. I mean, it makes sense you would try to sock somebody on the street that you thought was a, a part of that. I mean, the logic follows. Um, and, you know, I know that, you know, Eric tried to say that he was, intimidated by this, you know, guy on a bike, but, you know, I mean, we all saw it, so you can judge your own conclusions from it. But I think the physical violence part of it is, you know, I'm a Girardian, so it's a part of this mimetic whipping up, you know, where all of this culture war language at some point builds up to violence. That's the way it always happens. It's just anthropologically correct in every way. And yeah, so there you go. Well, and did, did it surprise you that he uh, ran backwards? Uh, that was quite a move. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that, quite like that. <laughs> it was, a, I think it was more of a prance than it was uh, <laughs> running. Um, and it was impressive, you know, I have to say. Uh, some some fancy footwork there, you know, he wears those, uh, you know, loafers with with the tassels and without any socks. So you have to keep that in mind as well. Um, pretty, pretty impressive. Um, also very, very speedy. The thing that struck me, though, was that his explanation for slugging the guy was that he felt like the guy was intimidating his wife, Suzanne, and Harry Jackson, who's the pastor, but, you know, he was like 30 yards away from the guy, 
and the guy was back with Harry Jackson and Suzanne and, you know, Eric was in a different county by that <laughs> point. So it's, um, you know, go figure. Well, it's strategic, I guess. Yes, yeah, strategic. Right. I like strategic. Okay. <laughs> well, and, you know, it came from the, uh, from that uh, White House event. And uh, there have been a number of those events where uh, people are just uh, gathered together, uh, no masks, uh, you know, sitting around uh, just admiring Donald Trump, um, who we learned, of course, had COVID and, uh, and became uh, the focus point for a super spreader event. And uh, I, I just... Uh, you know, what do you think about what's going on with uh, Christians becoming the focus of super spreader events? I mean, are we we, we seem to be uh, becoming uh, known as COVID kind of spreaders or truthers? Yeah. Well, I think that when you've, you know, grown up your whole life and you've heard preaching about, you know, Paul you know, sticking his hand in a fire and getting bit by a snake and it didn't affect him and how God's, you know, healing people, especially if you come from that more charismatic, you know, tradition. What What's surprising to me, and we can talk about this later, is how like the, the old codger, reformed, crusty, you know, grizzled and wizened theologians are now cozying up with all these wacko charismatics and you know super low church people it's it's interesting the bedfellows that have been oh my, created oh my. around right. all of all of this stuff like people that never would have been seen dead at a tony perkins event are now like all in you know <laughs> we'll talk about that yeah. but you know i think that um what i, I actually uh, wrote, wrote a piece for religion and politics uh, magazine on this. I ha and I spoke with M McKay Coppins at the Atlantic about this last week. There is this, you know, intersection between the COVID trutherism thing and what I call Trump's lowbrow, you know, version of the messianic secret, mm -hmm. where, you know, last time when you know evangelicals were being challenged on how could you possibly support you know this man the 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 line was you know he's he's crude he's crass we're embarrassed by him you know um but you know if you can't be with the one you love one you know love the one you're with you know the old Stephen Salt still song this time around thanks to Q of QAnon who is acting in the role of the Holy Spirit. I prefer to call him as Adam West Batman talked about the Joker, that ubiquitous, iniquitous enigma. Uh, Q has anointed Trump, not as just this sort of, you know, haphazard, you know, walked backwards into it, say, you know, um, uh, champion for, you know, political incorrectness and by extension, you know, evangelicalism. He's now Messiah. I mean, and so him, you know, going back to Eric, you know, a lot of people focused on the 666 beast version and revelation mm -hmm. when Eric said, you know, who is like unto thee, O Trump? Yes. Who is like unto thee? That's actually the song of Moses from the Exodus. So, who is like unto thee, O Lord, majestic in holiness, fearful in praises, working wonders? Who is like unto thee? So, in this article that, that I wrote, I said, you know, we our political discourse is so dumb now. The only move for right-wing evangelicalism is messianism. That's the only thing they got left. You know, you, he has to be, he cannot just be, you know, a, a tool used by God. He has to be the Messiah himself. So he miraculously came back from COVID and this means that God is at work in him and he was healed. And, you know, so it's just that, 
that language can be leveraged any which way you want it to. And, um, you know, they don't really, they don't really care if they're, you know, spreading the virus and, you know, who, who gets sick because it's the, you know, it's their esoteric abstract principles and, you know, presuppositions that matter more than people's lives, health, well-being, jobs, you know, they're the ones that always, the, the, the lazy move is to always say, why the left wing are nothing but a bunch of Gnostics. You know, I've heard that for mm -hmm. 40 years now. Mm -hmm. it, the right wing evangelical community, it, they are the Gnostics now. They're the ones who are pretending like life on planet Earth doesn't matter. You know, the, you know, people can die, the Earth, the climate can go to hell in a handbasket. Who cares? As long as our, you know, four walls and a church are, you know, uh, are upheld and unbothered by, you know, public health ordinances and the like. Yeah, it's the, uh, the the idea that if we don't get uh, Trump elected again for a second term, that uh, we lose it all. It's all yeah. gone, whatever it is. I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's all gone. Yeah, that's in, in uh, Strunk and White, that's called the, uh, the ambiguous antecedent. You know, we, we haven't quite figured out what it is, but it is, you know, we, we lose it all. Like America is over. You know, there's this mm -hmm. apocalyptic um, uh, scenario. And, and, and again, that's why the religious liberty shtick is always parlayed for that sort of fear mongering. You know, Trump, Trump tweeted out when, you know, those guys from Doug Wilson's church out in Moscow, Idaho were, creating a public health threat. He pointed to that because he knows that, you know, that sort of thing is the thing that, you know, will motivate, you know, evangelicals, you know, we're, you know, we're coming for your kids. We're coming for your dogs and kittens and bunnies, you know, they're going to all be taken away by the, you know, uh, um, remember the old sermon illustration we all heard growing up about in communist Russia, you know, they storm in, the KGB storms in and says, you know, um, this is an illegal church meeting. And, you know, if you, uh, you've got a choice now, if you're not a pro professing Christian, leave now. And everybody gets up and leaves except for four or five stalwarts and they say we just want to know who the true christians were mm -hmm. now let's have a bible study you know like that is <laughs> this all there's a there is an archaeology behind all of this stuff and that's what they think they're doing right now they think that there's a it's a purity thing mm. and uh, the uh, doug wilson uh, in idaho uh, what you're referring to there is the, the mask protest that got uh, turned into uh, persecution for Christ, uh, but they were violating the mask ordinance. Yeah. They, they weren't being arrested because they were preaching. They uh, were taken away because they refused to wear, uh, to, to do uh, the mitigation requirement. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it's, um, it's like uh, that, old, that old novel that, you know, pictorial novel the gospel blimp where this you know guy you know wants to share the gospel with his neighbor next door and he goes to these extraordinary lengths to build this gospel blimp to you know tell the good news and he's like the guy was next door like send people an email if you want to preach you know go on your podcasts you know mask up and play a pre-recorded message on a loudspeaker, you know, it, there's obviously it's not about religious liberty as, as very little for these people actually is about religious liberty. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's a, it's a shell game. And, you know, at least we're wise to it by now. Person in this congregation tonight. Last Sunday night, uh, the, the Family Research Council 
had a uh, event that they called the Freedom Sunday, and uh, it was uh, kind of a combination Trump rally, uh, COVID truther event. Uh, there was a physician that came out and said COVID's not really as bad as as uh, you've been told. And there were a number of uh, people. Uh, Blaine Grudem was there. John MacArthur uh, saying his false statistics and. Uh, the, nobody was wearing masks, uh, there wasn't any social distancing, and it uh, was really, uh, I mean, a potential super spreader type event. Uh, and you can see there in the, the pictures, uh, you know, what's going on there. But one of your uh, old friends, Al Moeller, uh, was asked to speak about the role of government, and particularly Romans 13. So I'd like you to give it a listen and uh, see what you think on the other side. Okay. We have to measure and weigh what the Scripture says. What does the Scripture say in terms of giving instruction to the church where we are today? Well, you know, I think it's so interesting you brought up Romans 13 because our minds as Christians just go immediately there where Paul talks about the righteous role of government so much that the reformers said that uh, we always need to understand that when the government acts rightly, it's acting as the servant of God. But we not only have Romans 13 about obeying government, we also have the orders of, uh, say, uh, Daniel or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Old Testament, examples of those who would not bend the knee. And, and let's remember the Apostle Paul would not declare that, uh, that the Roman emperor was God and, uh, and paid for it with his life as a martyr. So, you know, we, we're in a position where we need to remember that uh, righteous uh, orders are to be obeyed, rational laws, even temporary restrictions. But when we see uh, an order not to worship the one true and living God, with the church order not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, where there are just blanket and discriminatory prescriptions against churches, uh, we've got to call it what it is, and, uh, and we've got to resist. All right. Uh, so there's um, uh, your old friend Al Mohler. What uh, did you think about that? Well, I mean, it, it, it's a little bit of a shocker to see, you know, Al Mohler on a family research council event, you know, and see people like John MacArthur partnering with Charismatics. You know, I'm old enough to remember John MacArthur writing these books, Charismatic Chaos, and like these reform guys at one point thought that, you know, FRC and things like Calvary Chapel were, you know, full, filled with theological errors and heresies and you know, now they're all just in one, it's, you know, st strange bedfellows again, all because they're, you know, trying to get, A, trying to get Trump reelected, but B, they're all, uh, all of these people are scared of their constituencies. So they're trying to tack as far to the right as they possibly can and, you know, win political points because, and they have to keep going further and further around the horn in order to, you know, it's like a drug addict. They, they have to keep getting more and more extreme in order to, you know, reach their base. You know, again, we can come back to that later. But, you know, it, it seems incredibly disingenuous to, you know, create this clause for, you know, we obey the government whenever it's something we want the government to do, but it is incredibly convenient for us to disobey the government and find some other passage in scripture to justify when, you know, we don't want to obey, you know, what the government is doing. And this is the madness that is created by ransacking the Bible for illustrations. The exact thing we were taught not to do in hermeneutics classes in seminary, you know, where we were taught about authorial intent. And, you know, um, so it, it's, you know, the, the people that used to talk about objective truth and, you know, authorial intent are now postmodern relativists when it comes to textual interpretation that, you know, you can basically justify whatever you want to do. Uh, based upon some text of scripture. And by the way, I would not be going to 
Daniel, Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah. Those were their Hebrew names, not, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's not culturally appropriate to call them by, by those names. I mean, what's the actual story of the book of Daniel and Jeremiah? It's that they loved being in Babylon. Look at Jeremiah 29, 11, you know, the famous passage that everybody writes in their yearbook, you know, in high school, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, <laughs> plans to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope. Nobody remembers the context of that. The context is Yahweh speaking to the exiles in Babylon, and he says, seek the good of the city in which you have found yourself, for in the city's well-being and prosperity you will find your own happiness. So actually, the exiles loved being in Babylon, and which is only proved further by reading Ezra and Nehemiah, in which we find that no one wanted to go back to Jerusalem when the order, the decree, I mean, it was a bunch of, you know, half-wits and miscontents that, that you know, hobbled back there, and Zerubbabel, who was the governor that was originally, you know, he, you know, in, in put back in Jerusalem, he disappears halfway through the narrative. Where does he go? He went back to Babylon. So this notion that there's this vast gulf of fix between secular culture, the well-being of secular culture, and the health and well-being of our neighbors versus us doing whatever, you know, the hell we want to do in our own churches, you know, public health ordinances be damned, it is, is so uh, curious and um, twisty and perverse that, you know, one, one uh, hardly knows how to begin and end with this, this sort of um, the gymnastics that it takes mm -hmm. to get on board with this sort of thing, textually, exegetically, philosophically, etc., well, it, it appears from the um, from the rhetoric that we're being told that we can't speak the name of God, that we can't uh, worship in any way, shape, or form, that we are being asked to deny all that we believe in in this day and age. And well, uh, has anybody been asked to do that? Uh, well, no. Where and is it? Uh, again, like you might, it, you might be able, if they would have had, you know, a high tridentine Roman Catholic on there, you might have been able to mount, you know, an argument for the fact that if you are not physically present for the, you know, for the sacrament, you know, it, it, you do not actually receive the body and blood of Christ. Now we know that. The Roman Catholic Church has found a way around this during the pandemic, but it's so fun. It's hilarious to me that these reformed guys that, you know, for years and years have talked about the spiritual nature of the church and, you know, the church is not a building and it's not, there's the spiritual dimension. And as Baptists, Holy Moses Warren, as Baptists, the key doctrine is the invisibility of the church. <laughs> so it's hilarious to say that, well, if we can't, you know, show up in a parking lot and, you know, walk into the, you know, four doors of an air conditioned building, it's not church. I mean, th th there's, the theology has been thrown out the window long ago. This is about money. It is about cash flow. And listen, I get it. You know, it, it's every business has been harmed mm -hmm. by the Offerings pandemic. Are bad. You know, I mean, right? I mean, th these churches are businesses. Their cash flow has been affected by their inability to move people in small, isolated spaces, you know, and so they don't like that. Well, tough noogies. I mean, it hurts all of us. But the problem is, is that the Trump administration has done such a galactically bad job managing this crisis. That's why we're still in it. That's right. That's right. 
Well, and, and there, there's the irony, isn't it? That here you have uh, people supporting <laughs> the very candidate, the very person who has made their job so difficult. I mean, we had this gone better at the beginning, had there been a plan, you know, we might be in a different place now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and they're, they're acting as though they're speaking in the age before the advent of the electric light bulb. You know, I mean, we, we have streaming services. We, all, every, we're able to communicate perfectly, you know. It would, would it be nice, you know, I mean, it's like Brian Wilson Beach Boys territory. Wouldn't it be nice if we were older and we didn't have to? Wouldn't it be nice if the pandemic wasn't here? Yeah, it would be nice if we could do all the things that we used to like to do yeah. before the pandemic. It would be nice. But is it theologically, morally, or ethically necessary? No, it's is not. It, is it reality? Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i mean listen um reality bites you know there's a good 90s reference for you mm -hmm. all right <laughs> well uh <laughs> I, I wanted at some point to uh i mean i'm gonna you know get serious again um is, you know the, the um uh, another irony to me is that you have a, a strategy that has led to so many deaths in what is supposed to be a pro-life party. Yeah. And it is, it has occurred to me that there is no pro-life party. Yeah. And uh, I've been, you know, since we talked before, I, that's something I've wanted to ask you about, you know, what's your view of that? Is there a pro-life? I mean, are we completely goofed up to think that we could, <laughs> advance any kind of culture of life, any kind of value of life by looking at any political strategy, with it, particularly given, given what we've got to work with. Well, I mean, I, the, the catchphrase pro-life is so belabored under the historical and metaphysical weight of that of that term, you know, it's impossible to rescue it. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know that the phrase pro-life is even a meaningful notion to talk about anymore because it has been so corrupted by illicit and, um, you know, frankly, cynical reasons. But I would say, you know, from, from where I sit in New York City, it's run by Democrats, the Democratic Party is at least li the life adjacent party. I mean, they're against people being, you know, children being separated from their parents at the border, being thrown into, you know, cages to die, you know, against hysterectomies being performed against, you know, immigrant women who came to, you know, our borders for, for a better life. You know, it was here in, you know, the big bad blue city of New York City that we, we were the ones that got hammered the hardest at the pandemic. And you know what? We masked up, washed our hands, closed our businesses and got out of it, you know, for a, a long time. And, you know, maybe now there's going to be another surge, but that was led by, you know, a Catholic democratic president, uh, you know, governor, Andrew Cuomo. And like, it, it seems to me like if anybody is actually advocating for things that add to life and the quality of life, you know, for, you know, 99.99% of people, it seems like the Democrats, it's the, it's the Republican Party that is the hale bop comet death cult right now. And um, sorry, not sorry, but, you know, uh, that's the way I think about it. Yeah. Well, I, I think of the drone strikes in Somalia. I think of the support for the uh, civil war in Yemen. Yeah. Uh, abandoning the Kurds uh, where, you know, 
which we don't know the whole story yet uh, there. Great point. Uh, and so I can't, um, I, I just can't find a consistent. Uh, Propping up the North Korean regime. Oh my goodness, yes. You know, in, in, in which there has been a legitimate holocaust. The, the Uyghurs in, uh, and their incarceration in yes, China. Yes, yes. I mean, I mean, listen, okay, on this point, Warren, why is it that John Oliver on last week tonight gave a more morally compelling case for why we should care about the Uyghurs and the religious persecution that's happening in China than any of the so-called religious liberty you know, heroes that run these organizations in our time. The, the, the answer is because they are, they're so scared of their constituencies that they can't say anything that would be outside of what is allowed. You know, they, you want to talk about political correctness. Mm -hmm. The heart of it is in Trumpism mm -hmm. because your bandwidth of what you're allowed to talk about is about that narrow. You get outside of that and, you know, it's the queen of hearts off with his head. Well, Freedom Sunday mentioned nothing about freedom for anybody except for people that sit in their churches and infect each other. Yeah. About how I yeah. saw it. Freedom to kill. Love it. <laughs> okay. Well. I... <laughs> it's a happy little conversation. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, I can see where uh, you stand on that. Uh, and, and, you know, being in that place um, has put uh, a number of evangelicals in a strange spot. Uh, I know you commented on John Fia's piece in New York Daily, um, because, you know, John uh, is a friend of mine, and, and uh, you know, I think he thinks many of the same things that, that we're talking about now. And uh, uh, I uh, would like to read to you mm -hmm. a piece from his uh, most recent column. But I also get the sense that my church is keeping me at arm's length. This may well be a smart move since I am a divisive figure. I have tried to use my voice and platform to criticize a morally corrupt president of the United States and the Christian and conservative media infrastructure that props him up. Why am I bringing this up right now? Last week, I had an emotional conversation with an evangelical Christian whom I love deeply. This person does not understand how friends, family, and fellow Christians can support the current president. The first presidential debate upset my friend. How could Christians vote for a man who refuses to condemn racism, lies endlessly, and lacks basic empathy? My friend is considering giving up on church and the Christian faith. My friend is trying to hold together friendships with Trump supporters, but does not know how to do it and remain true to his or her deepest convictions. Does any of that uh, ring true for you? How does that sound to you? Uh, it sounds like uh, somebody's, you know, been you know, listening in on my phone conversations with, you know, uh, so many of the people that, you know, the erstwhile friends who, you know, we were, we were a part of this thing uh, called evangelicalism that we, we at one time thought had some kind of center, thought had some kind of, um, you know, uh, you know, guardrails uh, around it that, you know, we're just, I mean, if, if, if Trump has miraculous abilities, it, it, it uh, lies in one area, which is to obliterate all of the so-called bedrock convictions and talking points of, you know, evangelicals for, for, for decades, you know. And it, it reminds me of Paul Henry writing to his father, Carl. Paul Henry was a congressman from Michigan and a, a political science professor writing to, to Carl Henry after his, you know, 
uh, break up with Christianity today and, you know, uh, the powers that be there said, boy, dad, it's so great. You are now um, out of, uh, you know, out of the way and free from the evangelical authority structure. So I think, you know, a lot of people see uh, not just fundamentalism taking over this rampant, you know, which is something that, you know, John has talked about. John Fee has talked about, but it's, it's worse than that. It's worse than fundamentalism. It's, it's uh, almost like an S and M cult. You know, there's a masochistic quality to it, which is to punish anyone that does not, you know, toe the line and to uh, withhold any kind of blessing or, extension of brotherly or sisterly love to anyone with whom you disagree. There's a great article, but that Michael Bird, the, you know, New Testament, great New Testament mm -hmm. scholar, mm -hmm. uh, wrote, uh, I think yesterday, uh, saying that the, you know, the call to excommunicate people, you know, on, on the basis of, you know, not talking about justice issues, like racism and economic inequality and how um, the advantages that a privileged class levy over those who do not, to not talk about things is a broadside against the very concept of Christian love. Mm. So if any of this ever meant anything, um, you know, there's certainly not evidence from it, from the, the, the people who run the institutions and organizations that have always been regarded as bellwether institutions. Mm. Speaking of that, um, that reminds me of one Owen Strayan, <laughs> who wrote recently that uh, wokeness is the new impardonable sin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, I'm interested in your your response to that, your reaction to that. That uh, people who persist in uh, being woke uh, should be excommunicated or uh, kicked out of their church or disciplined in some way. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, get ready. I mean, <laughs> first of all, uh, you know. Anybody that is actually, you know, cares about racial injustice and economic injustice or the, you know, violence against, you know, any kind of minority, be it racial, sexual, or, or the like, are not going to be a part of any church uh, that is within a country mile of anything that... Oh, and strict. So that's, that is just, um, that's just, you know, absolute um, hooey, you know, like that's just platforming. That's just grandstanding. What Owen's actually going on about here is an internecine debate mm -hmm. that is happening in the Southern Baptist Convention right now where there is this perception that you know um some of the center set institutions like southeastern seminary and southern seminary have allowed the trojan horse of you know critical race theory and wokeness to infiltrate its ranks with its you know professors and and so forth the you know um, Ethics and Religious Liberties Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention that Russell Moore is, you know, secretly a closet Democrat taking money from George Soros. And so I wish I could get my Soros payment. <laughs> you know, where do is we that get how it you live so well? You, all that Soros money? I mean, you know, I, I uh, but, you know, if it came my way, you know, I would I, I wouldn't have any problem taking it, but you know you know poor poor Russ didn't, and he still is He's still getting it. Yeah, uh, Kelly Kohlberg is on his case, um, but but that's really all about trying to take over institutions mm. 
from, you know, sort of this rear guard action. So, okay. you know, that it's really about a small world of politics and everybody's, you know, trying to read it outside of that context, but it's, it's really kind of a dirty little swimming pool of who controls, you know, the institutions that are supported by, you know, a government program called the Cooperative Program of the S Southern Baptist Convention. Keep in mind that all of these guys that are professors in Southern Baptist seminaries are basically on the dole. I mean, they don't have to hustle like normal institutions. They get millions of dollars pumped into their institutions every year by little old ladies sitting in church pews giving their tithe money, which they think is going towards missions, but is really going towards these, you know, little Lord Fauntleroy's that are, you know, you know, talking about wokeness and having their little internal theological squabbles. It's sick. It's sick. And, um, you know, but that's what's going on. Well, people but, like Owen Strand. So the, but the upshot is that uh, it's dividing I mean, it's still it's still creating a climate where um, you know black and brown pastors in the SBC are saying we're not welcome here. Yeah, right. I mean, that, isn't that the yeah effect? yeah Dwight McKissick, who's a Southern Baptist pastor, said I would never send you know uh, any young black uh, aspiring pastor to Southern Seminary because you know just yesterday they said well we're you know we we're certainly not going to change any names on buildings of, of people who are slaveholders and not only slaveholders but fierce advocates for um you know a biblical uh argument for racial inequality you know and so that that just happened yesterday at southern that is their way of responding to this owen strand right wing you know, uh, attempt to undermine the, you know, the people that have been, you know, sitting in their chairs for 20 plus years, like Al Mohler and, and uh, Danny Aiken and, and, and people, people like that. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you right now, there's a whole, I mean, the, the, the presidents of CCCU institutions and, you know, of these agencies like in the SBC and other evangelical institutions, they are praying hope against hope that Trump loses so that they can go back to their bully pulpits where they thunder from mountaintops about a whole range of things. Right now, they can't say anything because it has gone swung so far to the right that it's, you know, at the lunatic fringe. So they're, they quietly are just, please, let us go back to the days where we could you know, talk about the big bad boogeyman of the, you know, of the secular left, which was our, you know, bread and butter. So like the night after Trump's, you know, refusal to, uh, or the week after Trump's refusal to condemn white supremacism, you know, Al Mohler, his big issue is Joe Biden's lack of political courage for not being more forthright about Supreme Court packing. Really? Like that's the biggest that's, issue. Yeah, that's your issue. Got right now, you know, it's like um, uh, it, it's it, it's it, it's a great apocalyptic moment. It's a revelation of what you know what has always been, and um, you know those white supremacist uh, colors are um, uh, really showing. Well, now you, you've, you've taken us to the present here just about, and I, I think uh, I want to, I really want to continue talking, and uh, after the election, we'll have to get back together and yeah. talk about a post-Trump <laughs> church. I mean, what, what in the world are we going to look like, uh, you know, if, if Trump loses I, or wins? I mean, whatever happens. Um, you know, there's there's uh, something. Well, I mean, the the, the mass 
exodus has already begun. You know, um, you know, my children see what is going on. They've known all these people all their lives. And, you know, to, to quote, uh, you know, my hero, Larry Norman, from his song, The Great American Novel, the sheet you wear upon your face is the sheet your children sleep on. And at every meal you say a prayer, you don't believe, but still you keep on. And I think that the generation of, of, of young people that have seen the lack of nerve to confront evil and cruelty and bigotry, um, they're not gonna want anything to do with this and who can blame them. All right, well, I guess it's up to us to do that for our own kids. Yeah, yeah. Keep them close. And um, uh, it's great to talk to you, Warren. Thanks for, thanks for having uh, me on again. I really appreciate it. It's always well, fun talking to you. It is with you as well. And thanks for your time. And uh, we will do it again. I, I really want to. Mm -hmm.